wonderful to have so many people from around the world joining us this, this today for our uh, webinar on critical reflections in the family in the context of violence against women. Um, first of all, I'm just going to do a round of introductions from our side. My name is Liz Dartnell. I'm from the Sexual Violence Research Initiative, um, or the SRI, uh, better known as. The SRI aims to promote uh, better improved responses and prevention of sexual and intimate partner violence and violence against children in low and middle income countries using evidence. And on the behalf of the SRI and the University of South Australia and Raising Voices, I am super delighted to welcome you to this interactive webinar, our first webinar of 2018. Over the next hour, we want to explore with you one of the themes emerging from the SRI Forum 2017, the impact of male perpetrated violence against women on family roles, relationships and expectations. If you'd like some more information on the s Forum and other themes emerging from that event, please look at the brief, uh, please download the brief at the link uh, being shown on the screen right now. And please, you're welcome to get more information on this webinar and the other partner organisations on the links on the screen showing now. We have two really wonderful speakers to help start the conversation, Sophie Namey from Raising Voices and Fiona Buchanan from the University of South Australia. But before we get started and I formally introduce our speakers, I want to hand over to my really great colleagues from the SVRI, Morma Maremi and Laura Fitzhenry, who are briefly going to talk you through the webinar tech we're going to use for today's webinar. So over to you, Morma and Laura. Hello everyone, my name is Moma. Today I'll be providing you with a few pointers on using Zoom technology so you get the best out of this webinar. First, some housekeeping. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. If you don't wish to be recorded, please keep your microphone turned off. We will make the webinar recording available on, F on the SVRI and partner websites and we will share it via our social media platforms and SVRI update. Now to Zoom. We ask that you all please keep yourselves on mute and turn your video off to minimize background noise. Unmute yourself only when you are speaking. We recommend you use headsets with microphone if you have them to capture the best sounding audio of the discussion. Now moving on to Zoom, on how to use Zoom. If you run your mouse at the bottom of your screen, you will see the Zoom menu bar. On the left far hand, you will see an icon to mute and unmute audio start or stop video. You are welcome to start your video when you ask questions. We do have the power to mute you and turn off your video, so we can do it for you in case you forget. As you scroll along your screen towards the right hand side, you will see a chat facility. If you want to message us regarding technical during the presentation, you can type in chat and we will respond to you. Should you have questions related to the presentation, type them in the chat box. We will take note of all your questions and feed them back to presenters to respond to them after the presentation. If you can't see chat box, you may need to exit full screen first, scroll to the bottom of the screen and select view option and then select exit screen. Thank you all. Over to you, Liz. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mulma. Um, I feel much more confident on how to use the Zoom technology, and I hope you all do too. But please know you're welcome to ask us questions at any, any time through the, throughout the webinar via the chat box. Um, and Laura and Mulma will be monitoring your, your, your questions and comments. Now to the reason we're all here. I'm super honoured to introduce you to Sophie and Fiona. So first to Fiona. Fiona Buchanan is a senior lecturer with the University of South Australia. Before entering academia, Fiona worked with women and children survivors of intimate partner violence in both the United Kingdom and Australia. She's published widely in international journals and authored four book chapters. Her new book, Mothering in Domestic Violence, Beyond Attachment Theory, which she's going to be presenting on today, was published in 2017. And please feel free to go and look for that online. I'm sure it'll be a fantastic read. Now to Sophie. Sophie Naimi is the Learning Coordinator at Raising Voices in Uganda. She's responsible for developing their research and learning strategy across violence against women and violence against women prevention programming. She's been working in the field of violence against women for over seven years and is currently co-leading a study of SUS's adaptability for different contexts 
as well as supporting ongoing research around the Good Schools Toolkit. Again, fantastic resources, and please do find them online after this um, webinar or contact by either Sophie or Fiona for more information. You'll, be, you'll absolutely agree with me, we have two wonderful speakers. So how will the webinar run? Fiona and Sophie are going to present on mothering and domestic violence and the intersections between violence against women and violence against children for about next 20 minutes or so. And then we plan to open up for discussion and reflection. So please gather your thoughts, your ideas, share them with us either after the presentations or via the chat and we will make sure they get fed back to the presenters. So now I am delighted and honoured to hand over to Fiona to present on mothering in domestic violence, why I look further than attachment theory. Hello, bear with me while I just get my PowerPoint on. Sure. Can you hear me? We can hear you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay, whoops, cancel that. Um, <laughs> Ah, no, I don't want to leave the meeting. No, you don't want to do that. We're looking <laughs> for the presentation. Ah, share screen is what I'm looking for. Share screen, there we go. And that's what I'm looking for, I think. Yes, got there. Okay. Um, now, just need to... Sorry, things have moved about on my screen. That's always interesting, isn't it? Uh, I'll maybe just stay the way we have it at the moment rather than take up valuable time. Okay, so um, start at the beginning is always a good idea. Okay, greetings from Australia. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to quickly explain why I wanted to look further than attachment theory and briefly speak about my research, but then focus on what I found and what the implications of this are for policy and practice. The illustration on this slide um, comes from a group collage that participants in my research did, but more of that later. Okay, so the background. When I was working as a social worker with women and children, um, many of whom were in domestic violence, the attachment theory approach bothered me because I felt that there was much more to relationships between women and their babies. And the searchlight of attachment theory was very narrow. So I wanted to hear from women about their experiences. And I particularly wanted to know about building mother-child relationships and domestic violence, because it seemed to me that attachment theory did not look far enough, and that sometimes that resulted in mother blaming. So this was my research question, which is, as most research questions, quite long-winded. Uh, Basically, what I wanted to do was rather than observe and categorize, I wanted to learn how we could help from hearing about women's experiences so that we could support relationships between women and children and focus on the strengths that they brought rather than focusing on deficits. So the research involved 16 women from diverse um, communities, including Aboriginal women, women from the Middle East, from uh, Europe and from Africa. And this was qualitative research where I interviewed each of the women in her own home and then they came together in groups. They talked and joined, they worked on the collage together and they sort of formed relationships with each other so that they supported each other. I then asked each woman to make a clay model which represented her relationship with her baby. And this was what I found, that from women's experience, they described how they were living with sustained hostility from their partners. And that hostility was directed towards the relationship between them and their baby. After the baby was born, that was the target of the hostility. And in response to that, they described in so many ways how they thought, felt, and whenever possible, acted protectively. 
and protectiveness came up time and time again. But there was also sadness about the loss of peaceful time to spend with their babies. So this is what basically what the research showed was that women responded to sustained hostility with protectiveness, but sustained hostility restricted the space and time that women had to spend at peace with their babies. And I'll explain more in the next three slides. Remember I mentioned the clay models. Well, the next three slides have three of the women's models in them. And women also explained, they, they told the rest of the group what their models represented. And that was very moving and very emotional for the whole group. Um, so, sustained hostility really sort of came across in many ways. This, Women spoke about how their partners caused fear through physical attacks on, on them, often in front of the babies. And they spoke about the threats to the baby, actual threats to the baby. There was a general lack of support for mothering. So nobody was backing them up in their new mothering role. And how partners undermined mothering. They were never good enough. They never did well enough in the mothering role as far as the partner was concerned. There was increased isolation because for, you know, for many who had been working, this was the first time at home with a baby. They weren't allowed to go out to socialize. They weren't allowed to have friends and family around. They had hugely unrealistic expectations from their partners who expected the baby, the house, them, them to be all perfect at all times, all perfectly clean and all perfectly in order. And that led to exhaustion for many of the women. And they also spoke about financial deprivation. They spoke about things about not having money to actually get formula for the baby, to be able to buy nappies. One woman spoke about how she had to dress her child from uh, op shops, what we call op shops, charity shops because there was no money handed over. So that was some of the things that constituted um, sustained hostility. Protectiveness. Okay, protectiveness was present in so many ways that are not generally recognized as protective and certainly ways that are not observed by others. But all the women were thinking, feeling, and when possible, acting protectively. And that happened whether they were attached to their babies or not. And if some of these women had been put through the assessment and categorization of attachment theory, I'm sure it would have come out that they were not securely attached. Anyway, they spoke about how they went to extraordinary lengths to appease their partners because they were concerned for the baby's safety. They held the babies close when it was safe to do and kept them out of harm's way when it wasn't. So sometimes they would put, if they thought that their partner was going to go off, they'd put the baby away in the bedroom where they wouldn't be witness or be put at um, risk. <coughs> Excuse me. They were picking up and acting on baby's cues when they noticed that the baby was frightened. And there were a lot of instances where they described dealing with the threat and then providing comfort to the baby. So many, many sides to protectiveness that you wouldn't normally be aware of. Now, constricted space, I think this says it all from Elizabeth. I was too busy protecting my baby. I didn't have time to attach with him, to cuddle him, to play with him. <coughs> And this model is actually by an Aboriginal woman whose sister had died shortly before the baby, her last baby was born. And she, the cross is there because she said her sister was her inspiration to get out of the abusive relationship and keep her children safe. So what are the considerations for policy and practice? First of all, domestic violence constitutes an environment of sustained hostility um, in the ways that I've just, some of the ways that I've described. Protection may be the primary basis of connectedness between women and their babies in domestic violence. Maybe it's that protection that actually bonds mother babies together. And if we pay attention to 
real lived experiences of mothers in domestic violence, we need to recognize that hostility from the abuser to the mother-child relationship causes distress for both mother and child and protection becomes paramount and may well be the foundations for that connection. So policies need to recognize the need to support women so women and children can relate. And also to something that else that came out was that women use their agencies in many ways to protect and to find space to relate to their babies. Um, as far as finding space, one woman who was at university when her baby was small found herself spending all her time in childcare with her baby rather than going to lectures. And it was only during the research that she realized she did that because that was the only space she had to actually be with him at peace and not to be having to keep everything um, smart and clean and looking okay, which was the priority at home. So finally, the implications for practice. So first of all, um, we need to look at new way of working with women. And that's by asking women who mother in domestic violence about their own experience of sustained hostility. It was only, as I say, in, this, in the groups and in the interviews that women actually identified this for themselves and for each other's. We need to conceptualize relationships between women and their babies as protective and connectedness in protectiveness and connectedness intertwined. So ask about and validate protective feelings, thoughts and action. That can be a real way to let women see that they did, they did make a connection, they did care and what they did was good enough. But we also need to make space available for mothers and their babies to relate in peace. Okay, so that's about it from me. Um, you can get much more information on some of my publications, including my book. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Fiona, for this wonderful piece of work and this wonderful presentation and talking about the hearing from women about their lived experiences of parenting in the context of violence and using such creative methods to do so. So thank you. So now um, please hold your questions till the end. We're going to move over to Sophie, who's going to talk about work being done to develop a framework to better understand the intersections between violence against women and violence against children and the implications again for programming. So over to you, Sophie. Thanks so much, Liz, um, and also the SVRI team for hosting. And Fiona, thanks so much for your very thoughtful presentation. So I'm really happy to be here today. And let me see, let me just get, see if I can get the, the full slides to show. There we go. So we're gonna build on Fiona's discussion and look at how violence that women are experiencing intersects with other forms of violence in the family, and particularly violence against children as you know, they grow from, from the babies that we, we heard about in Fiona's presentation. In the past decade, the field has been generating strong evidence that points to the overlap of violence against women and violence against children. And this isn't particularly surprising, right? We see this in reality all the time. Clearly the lives of girls, boys, women, and men are highly interdependent and the behaviors of one family member, be it positive or negative, have repercussions that affect dynamics across the, the family. So we know that, we see that, we experience it in our programs and, and in our own lives. But when it comes to conceptualizing how and why this violence co-occurs, we have very few models to guide us. And what we also find is that much of our programming, our policies, and our research remain siloed into these two, these two silos of violence against women and violence against children. So at Raising Voices, our motivation for this research was really to better understand and unpack this apparent disconnect with the hope of laying the groundwork for integrated approaches to prevention. Raising Voices launched this intersection study in partnership with Columbia University and Macquarie University and support from the SVRI. 
we had um, three components of the study, but today I'm going to focus on this, this middle circle, the qualitative, where we explored in depth how women, men, girls, and boys were experiencing intersecting violence within their daily lives. I also wanted to acknowledge um, Katie Carlson, the co-PI on this study. Unfortunately, she couldn't join. I think, I hope she's sleeping. It's the middle of the night for her in, in Alabama. So in brief, in terms of the, the methods we used, we discussed perceptions and experiences of violence with um, four different groups of respondents, with women, men, girls, and boys. And we also disaggregated into um, distinct age cohorts. We uh, ran a series of focus group discussions and IDIs, and overall, we spoke with about 100 participants. Participatory methods were used throughout, <clears throat> and in particular during the FTDs, our central approach was this illustrated case vignette methodology. And you can see an example of that on the right side of the screen, which we found was quite effective, quite effective in focusing the discussions on the types of intersections we were interested in exploring. We also took several ethical precautions. So we interviewed only one member of each household. We partnered with a child protection agency to help us with referrals. And we were also quite intentional about the tone with which we concluded the conversation. So particularly discussing experiencing experiences with children was quite difficult and at times emotional. So we had a few strategies um, to try to leave and conclude the discussions on a more positive note. So what did we find? Our first key learning is that the patriarchal family structure normalizes many forms of violence, both against women and children in the family. And when we are talking about the patriarchal family structure here, we're looking specifically at the rigid gender and childhood norms. We're also looking at hierarchies based on age and sex. And finally, an emphasis on control over family members perceived as subordinate within that family hierarchy. Across the data, we found numerous illustrations of how this environment can really coalesce to normalize violence, both as a form of discipline and as an expression of masculine power in the home. And interestingly, participants often use similar language, irrespective of whether they were speaking of intimate partner violence or violence against children, many times blaming women and children for the violence they were experiencing. So this first quote um, illustrates how one mother normalized violence, and here she's explicitly infantilizing women in, in her explanation. So she shared that sometimes it's right to shout at your wife because there are times a wife behaves like a young child at home. If you are not tough with her, she might fail to understand. Then in the second quote, um, we see how participants at times justified violence as a natural expression of masculinity or um, conflating this use of violence with, with being a man in the family. And I'll just um, give you a moment to read that quote. So our second key insight is really that violence against women and violence against children does not just co-occur. Instead, what we found is that violence against women and violence against children can become much more deeply intertwined with the potential for one form to trigger the other and create these cycles of abuse within the family. Our analysis of the disclosure data shared during the interview suggested four patterns for this intersecting violence, which you see um, on the top of, of the conceptual model. So I will walk through those one at a time. The first we, ca we categorized as bystander trauma, and here we found um, women or children experiencing emotional harm from witnessing violence against another family member. Uh, in describing one of the vignette characters, a woman shared with us that when the father turned to the children, the mother cried so much because earlier she had endured the pain from his beating because she knew the children were safe. But when he turned to the children, she even put her hands on her head and wailed aloud. The next pattern we found was um, negative role modeling. And here children are adopting and mimicking abusive behavior that they're, they're seeing um, within their, their family. And this idea of social learning is certainly not new, but I think our, our data suggests um, an interesting way in which this can manifest. And essentially women's experience of partner violence can be compounded by the subsequent dynamic she experiences with her own children. And I think this, this um, quote um, explains it quite well. 
His mother shared that once the children hear your husband shouting at you, they will also start despising you. Like the child can even start telling you that I will report you to daddy. Do you get that? That means that the child, that means that the child despises you and thinks you are a nobody who is always shouted at or beat. The third pattern we've called protection and further victimization. And here we see how the intention to intervene, or in some cases, actual inter intervention, um, you know, this I think speaks well to the theme of protection, which Fiona spoke about, can trigger additional violence in the home. So this was a more extreme example where a man explained that he was in the process of beating his wife when the young child approached and moved towards the mother, and the man reacted by, by kicking the child as well. And finally, we found evidence of displaced aggression. This manifested in different ways, but one of the more prominent patterns was where a, a woman living with a violent husband redirected her hurt or her anger against um, her own children in light of the powerlessness she felt vis-a-vis -vis her husband. So to bring this together, what we have is the patriarchal family structure, which clearly positions men at the top of the age and the sex hierarchy and underpins the normalization of many forms of violence. So this environment enables and at times condones the use of violence against women and children, creating a vicious cycle, or to borrow from Fiona, an environment of sustained hostility that contributes to more violence in the current home, as well as for future generations. It also increases the risk that, that the violence against the women and against the children in the home will, will intersect or trigger one another in the patterns we discussed, which at times leads to multiple victimizations of physical and emotional violence. So what does this mean? How can we build on these insights when we start to look towards, um, towards programming? And you know, simply put, when we know the cause, we start to expose the solution. So our findings send a clear message that we need to start from a feminist frame and acknowledge the deep linkages between gender inequality, the normalization of violence, and the cycles of abuse that, that can happen within families. The persistence of victim blaming attitudes and the rigid norms that reinforce women and children's subordination demonstrate there's really still quite a lot of work to be done in this area, um, at least in Kampala where this, this research is based. And many of us working in the violence against women field, this, protective, this perspective is not new. Uh, but what we hope is that our work provides the conceptual basis to extend this feminist framework um, to work to prevent violence against children, as well as the nexus between violence against women and children. Um, there is this kind of key insight that emerges from our work is supported by other research. Um, Emma Fulu and colleagues recently published a paper using po population-based data to explore the intergenerational connections between experiencing and witnessing violence as a child and later violence perpetration or victimization in adulthood. And despite using a very different methodology, they draw similar conclusions to our localized qualitative study. And um, they say that their findings are essentially putting a spotlight on gender inequitable social norms and the normalization of violence as a critical focus for prevention. So that's um, that's really helpful, I think, to, to that we have we have that understanding coming from the work. But the challenge, of course, is how to operationalize it in practice. And I think we're still in the very early days of trying to figure this out with much more exploration and innovation needed. But I'd like to just leave us with a few ideas that rise to the surface based on the intersection study, as well as raising voices, many years of experience with both VAO and VAC prevention programming. So first, the kind of transformation we are discussing almost certainly requires holistic engagement and a critical mass to jointly envision and inspire towards a new way of structuring the family. We also feel there may be some low hanging fruit, even for independent programming addressing one form of violence or the other. For example, more acknowledgement and consideration of the intersecting nature of violence against women and children 
And we might imagine that um, in a program for training child protection officers, we could find ways to reflect some of these intersecting patterns into their pre-service training curriculum or other communications materials. Um, and that's, that's just one example. I think this next point really speaks to one of the hesitations we have at raising voices to pursuing an integrated agenda. And that's the risk of stigmatizing women or conflating them with children, or even creating conditions for one issue to swallow up the other. And to mitigate this, it's important that we dis distinguish between the various expectations for agency, for power, for relationships that we have at different phases of our lives and ensure that this is well reflected in our programming content as well as approach. And in addition, if this agenda is going to move forward, we, have, we, we will have to address mothers' use of violence against their children, as well as their ability to bond and attach, as, as Fiona, Fiona has shared. To do this from a feminist perspective means that we recognize the political and gendered context that disempowers women in many domains of their lives, while also granting them relative power vis-a-vis -vis their children. So here, I think there's a suggestion to avoid individual incident level analyses that might decouple a woman's use of violence from their limited power and circumscribed roles in the family. And finally, there's really this open invitation. It's to be bold, to go beyond what we know while keeping the ethical principles of do no harm in mind. Um, and really a lot of excitement around uh, this new space to develop and test programming that um, hopefully can start to destabilize and ultimately dismantle this patriarchal family structure. We have um, a few pieces out, and um, those are all available at Raising Voices website if you are interested in reading more. And you're also uh, very welcome to, to get in touch. And that is it. So thank you so much. And um, back over to you, Liz. Sophie, thank you so much. And thank you very much, both of you, for these two really wonderful, very different, but linked presentations. Um, you know, with the first presentation exploring women's lived experiences of parenting in the context of sustained hostility, as Fiona puts it, followed by Sophie's piece of work trying to understand these intersections and the interlinkages. And both presentations provided us with some really good insights and implications for policy and practice. So before we go uh, to uh, back to the presenters with questions, I wonder if we wouldn't both have both present, uh, presenters um, just give some reflections maybe at the end, sorry, but also just maybe what are some of your experiences to, to colleagues in the, on the Zoom group chat to around how or if at all early childhood development program, programs um, that you're working on do address family violence and the challenges of doing so. So if you'd like to share those with us, not the, not the presenters but the participants in the chat, we'd be really grateful to hear your ideas as well as your questions back to Fiona and Sophie. So over to all of you, you're welcome to unmute and ask questions and comment on your experiences. Lato, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question, please. Oh, thanks, Michael. Yeah, um, I just have a question from uh, the present number one. Uh, this is uh, uh, around uh, the question of, of sampling. Uh, how did she do the sampling, and what was the driver for sampling, and the composition of uh, Participant who, who responded to a uh, questionnaire or who responded to the tool that she prepared. Am I clear? Uh, Michael, no problem. So, um, to Fiona, is that you want to ask her about how she identified her participants? Um, mm -hmm. So, Fiona, would you like to answer that question? In, in between, are there any other questions before we move to Fiona? I have the the similar question for oral presentation, whether they can also describe the uh, sampling criteria and the composition of their sample. Maybe a bit of uh, 
the tools which they used for participatory, because I had something like a participatory uh, approach. So if I can also learn about the tools that they used to collect data. Great question. Thanks, Michael. So I'm going to hand over to Fiona to start and then to Sophie to also respond. Okay, thanks for the question, Michael. It's an interesting one and it's, yes, very relevant when you're trying to build relationships and be supportive as well as doing research. That I actually put an advertisement in local newspapers and asked for women who had mothered in domestic violence to come forward and they contacted me. Uh, there were some exclusion criterias. The women had to have, be, have to be out of domestic violence um, for a minimum of one year and that was because I didn't want to do any harm. I didn't want to actually make things worse for women who were still dealing with a lot of emotional stuff. Um, as far as the methods I used, uh, as I say, um, semi-structured interviews, which means I went to women's house, we made a time, and the women uh, basically told their story of the first year of their baby's life. Then we came together in focus groups, um, a set of two focus groups and two sets because we had 16 women, it was too many to all have together in one group. Um, so the women, I did some exercise with the women to actually um, get to know each other, to be less shy with each other and then in the second and they as I said made a collage they also did some ranking exercises around emotions and in the second set of focus groups they made a clay model of their own relationship with their baby and I photographed these and all the discussions were um audio recorded and then transcribed and the that was my data was the transcriptions from all the interviews and the focus groups does that answer your question michael yes that this is very helpful okay, thank you good. very clear thank you. yeah thank you hello can i ask the question yes please do okay this is nancy from uganda so my question one goes to Sophie um, when she talked about how to apply the framework, the feminist framework to the work that we do. One of the issues she raised is that uh, women's use of violence against children should be understood within the context of patriarchy. And so my question is then when and where do you draw that line? Because I can understand that, yes, sometimes when women experience violence, they can transfer that aggression to their children. But then when do they then out, like, when do we draw that line when it's not the violence that women are inflicting on children is the result of the system or the, or the violence that they're experiencing? And then the second uh, is the second thing I have is a comment. And I think I strongly agree with the issue of the fear of doing by combining programming of violence against children and women together because of the fear that it will further fant uh, infantilize women. Because I think that's a frame that's already been used a lot. Oftentimes, uh, women and children are put in one group. So, you know, if you try to address it together, then it kind of tends to reinforce what society really looks at, that women and children are one coherent group that should be treated the same way and they both need to be disciplined and courts and kept in their places. So I think that is a real fear to really reinforcing what the, the perception that's out there. Um, my other question goes to Fiona. I kind of, I don't know if she can go to her slide on uh, um, in um, the slide of, uh, what is it called? Implication for practice, something like that. What, what the, the findings would imply. Can, I, can she go back to that slide? I did not. I'm um, sure she can. Do it. So, Nancy, that will just require um, Sophie to stop sharing her screen and for her to share her screen. So, in while she's doing that, why don't we um, ask Sophie just to respond to your question about applying the framework? And then um, Fiona can put up her screen. And then I'd like to call on Chandre after we've had this discussion to talk briefly about her experiences of delivering a parenting program um, to women experiencing intimate partner violence. How does that sound? So over Great. to you, Sophie. 
Sounds great, Liz. Um, uh, Nancy, thanks so much for the question and also your your reflections um, on on how how this this fear of infantilizing women is you know bears out in some of the the work and and the experiences that we are already coming across through our programming. I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, so your question is a really good one, and I think you know I, I think it's not about condoning violence that that mothers you know mothers use of violence against children because clearly there still needs to be accountability and any you know there still needs to be this opening stance that no child should ever experience violence irrespective of what the, the underlying causes of that might be. So in putting this forward, I I, I think what we're trying to say is that by recognizing that even when mothers are using violence, that is still linked to the patriarchal context in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases um, that they're living in, what that suggests is that that's the starting place for prevention, right? If we want to prevent that kind of violence from manifesting in families, then we have to go deep and we have to start uprooting those patriarchal structures. So it's not it's not really to draw a line and say like in this this instance is it's it's kind of understandable or justified, and in these it's not. In terms of the actual you know the experiences for children, clearly all violence is harmful. Um, it's it's more to to shine a light on where we can start to. Um, um, to conceptualize and design our, our prevention approaches. So I hope that's that's helpful. Um, and I just wanted to mention one thing quickly, which I didn't I didn't have time to present in the slides, but there were a few times when um, participants rejected or contested the use of violence within our research. And interestingly, it was almost always um, children who were speaking about violence against mothers. And what they would say is they would say, yeah, but she's a mature adult just like him, so she shouldn't be um, receiving this, this violence. Um, so interestingly, that on the one hand condones violence against kids, right, because it's saying if she, it's implying that if she was a child, it would be okay. But it's also recognizing these, you know, that, that children and, and mothers are different and there are different expectations for how they should be relating within the family, even within environments where violence is highly normalized. So I'll just stop there, Michael. I know you might have other questions about on the methodology and the sampling for this, this research as well. And maybe just to save time, I will um, send an email afterwards with more information on that. Thanks, Sophie. Fiona, are you able to put up your slides or shall we, um, Nancy, would we, are you happy to wait until Fiona gets her slides up or should we move to Chandra whilst Fiona is putting up her slides. Or oh, Fiona, where are you? Have you got your slides up? I think that's fine. We can move on the next question, and once the slide comes, then I can ask the question later. Okay, that sounds fantastic. I wonder then, um, Chandra, would you like to share some of your insights? Thanks, Liz. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I'm undertaking research in collaboration with the University of Cape Town and a community-based organization in a small community in South Africa. And we're testing whether over three years we can bring about a shift um, towards positive parenting by delivering four parenting programs. Um, the one is an infant attachment program called Tula Sana that starts uh, six months well, it's six months um, pregnancy and home visitors visit mothers in their homes until the baby is six months old. And this is intended to promote infant attachment. And I suppose what I wanted to just notice is um, how our experiences underlie some of the findings of your study, in particular about isolation, but also I want to just talk about the messiness of these kind of real world experiences because we've had a, had a few cases where mums we've been visiting during pregnancy have been experiencing quite severe intimate partner violence. And what that does is it makes it very difficult for the home visitors to access them, both because the mother's afraid that um, the visit from the home visitor will be regarded as a threat by the partner. Um, and so what it is, it does is it makes it difficult for us to reach her and it also makes it very difficult for her to reach out to us for support or assistance. Um, 
So I guess we felt at one of the ways, one of the strategies that our home visitors have used where it's possible is to try and actually involve the father in the program. So that when the home visitor comes to the home, the father is present and they can engage the father then in the discussion about the pregnancy and about what is going on so that there is less sense that this is happening behind his back. I mean, I know this isn't an ideal kind of solution, but the, the hope is also that through delivering the program in this way, um, the father will also become attached to the child and that it may in some way uh, address his violence. Probably unlikely in the long run, but I just thought I'd put it out there. Chandra, thank you so much. I, I think that um, raises uh, some really, really interesting points about the complexity of doing this type of work. And I wonder if um, Fiona or Sophie, do you have any response to Chandra's um, experiences? I'd be really interested to hear what you have to say. And then we can move back to Nancy's question because I see that Fiona's slide is up. So yes, over to you. So um, yes, sorry about that. I had, I dropped, my Zoom dropped out there. Um, so I didn't hear all of Shandri's question. Could you just give me the gist of it again? I heard that end bit about um, fathers and involving fathers and looking at the father's attachment. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. So um, Liz, I don't know if you want to summarize. I'm not sure how to. I think we were, I was just really talking about how um, inter women who are experiencing intimate partner violence and who are the recipients of an infant attachment program, a home, de home um, visiting infant attachment program that we're delivering do find themselves isolated because home visitors find it difficult to visit yes. um, and they find it difficult to reach out. Quite obvious, I'm quite sure that's normal. But I was just talking then about one of the strategies that our home visitors have tried, which is to visit at times when the father is present. Mm. Um, so that in order to reduce the risk of um, the risk to the mother, in, on the one hand, and on the other hand, to try and involve the father in a way that is um, positive. Mm, yes, that's, that's an, an interesting approach. Um, my first, I think, um, response to that would be really careful to do no harm. Um, and do no harm to the mother's mothering and do no harm actually as far as the service provider goes. I was involved in the rolling out of a home nursing program here um, about attachment, which is why I first started cat, um, questioning what we were doing, um, because I did find that women were sometimes undermined because it seemed that everybody knew what she should be doing and what we didn't know what, what was what was going on for her and what she was thinking and what she was being um, subjected to and how she was actually pr uh, protecting in many ways that we didn't know and that she couldn't see in front of a partner, certainly. She wouldn't be able to say she wouldn't be able to be open. So different context, but yeah, um, yes, definitely sort of worth thinking about. As I say, I'm not, I'm not dismissive of attachment theory, but I do have big questions about how it's being applied. Okay. Thanks, Fiona. Um, Sophie, did you want to comment at all on that? The, I mean, this, it is complex and it is difficult, and Chandra, thanks for sharing that. I think it's... Um, yeah. Yeah, really, really complicated and com complex. So the mm. issue, is, of course, as Fiona was saying, do no harm. But I'm sure that's absolutely what's driving your programming in Chandra as well. Yeah, I'm um, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just to, to jump in for just a moment, it, it is, it's, thanks for raising this, Chandra, because it's so interesting to see all the messiness of when we start to apply this in practice, right? And I think, you know, for us, like the idea of involving, involving fathers is actually, is perfect because if we are thinking about more fundamentally changing the way families are structured and the way not just men and women are relating and not just, or not just women and their children are relating, but the way everyone is relating in the family, then clearly bringing in 
and the father can only only help to, to um, increase our chance of doing that effectively. Um, so I think it's great. And then, you know, just another aspect of the, the do no harm that gets messy is thinking about context where there's mandatory reporting laws in place. And then if you're starting to intervene in, in a family where, where children are experiencing violence, there's just, there's many layers um, in which this can become tricky quite quickly, which probably is one of the reasons why we haven't, we haven't done much in this space um, up until now. Thanks so much, Sophie. Um, just while you're on the line, we have a quick question from Michael around um, mechanisms in place to control trauma during interview. I'm sure you could just briefly talk a little bit about that before we go back to Fiona to answer Nancy's question. Yeah, sure, Liz. Um, thanks, Michael. So, you know, it's careful training, um, working with researchers who are already quite experienced in doing research around violence and with children, and of course, um, you know, maintaining all the recommended ethical protocols. Um, so training the, the interviewer to watch out for signs of distress um, and to, to um, steer the conversation in a different direction if, if that starts to become apparent. But I think really the protective mechanism was bringing in this, this child protection agency. We did have a few cases that required their, their um, expertise um, in case. Um, we had no explicit sampling around currently being in um, currently experiencing violence, but of course, given the prevalence, many of the participants we spoke with were experiencing violence in, in their day-to-day -day lives. So the way that we tried to safeguard around that was careful training and bringing in this, this uh, child protection organization that had the expertise that we lacked in the response side. Thank you, Sophie. And Nancy, thanks so much for your patience. Um, would you just mind repeating your question for Fiona? Because it has been some time since you asked it. Yeah, sure. I actually hadn't asked the question. I wanted to first see the slide. So Fiona, just to let you know, uh, so my, my role really uh, in the work that I do in violence against women prevention is really in the practice area. And so, yeah. you, you, so that's what I do every day. Like, I try to figure out what does it take to do this in practice. So in terms of the implications you put for practice, how do you see this being done? So if I'm, you know, my role is that. So how would I, for example, conceptualize relationships between women and their babies as protective? And after how I do that, then what would the likely implications be in terms of programming? How do you see that shifting programming? For someone who's really in practice, I think that would really be helpful for me. Like, how do I do this? And what is the implication or how should that influence then programming? Okay, thank you. Great questions. Um, as far as how you do that, one of the really interesting things um, during the research was that the women said they had never told the story of what happened in that first year of their baby's lives. They never actually got to tell anybody because people who were there to help would focus on safety planning on getting out on what needed to be done. And they felt quite empowered by telling their stories, by having other people who listened. So the first thing is to really listen and to draw out that, you know, to look for the times that women have been protective, to say, wow, so when you put your baby in the other room, you, were actually, you actually did that to protect the baby, you know. When you asked your mother if she could take the children, oh, sorry, this is going on to later research that I've done, but when you asked your mother if she could take the children at weekends, you did that to protect the children, to get them out of the way. So looking for these, and speak, because many women think they're not good enough because they haven't, they're not well attached in the conventional, um, using the conventional idea of that and so actually pointing out to women that they were doing their best and sometimes women failed absolutely and sometimes women um, ended up with child protection services because they had failed but pulling out looking for these protective thoughts feelings and where possible actions can actually remind the woman that they did try, they were trying their best. There is something to build on and that connection can be built from the fact that they were protective. There were times they were actually thinking, feeling and where possible acting protectively. Um, mm, so that's where the validating 
um, protectiveness comes in. And finding space as far as programs, um, I think it's, it's that acknowledgement that in domestic violence and maybe in other situations too, there is a lack of um, space, there's a lack of encouragement for women and children to, and small children to come together. And we've kind of lost the old um, mother baby groups that used to be very much part of society. And maybe they were part of white middle class society more than anything else. But actually looking for spaces where mothers and their young children can come together, supporting that, making that available um, to mothers and particularly mothers who are in domestic violence. Does that answer your question? Uh, I don't think it does as far as pivoting services. Um, certainly the service I worked with, we worked with attachment, uh, one of the services I worked with, we worked with attachment theory. We would video mother-baby interactions for five minutes and then make judgments about their relationship. I would like to see policy shifting from that sort of an approach to actually engaging, to really engaging with women and having the expectation that that's what service provision will be. That was very long winded of me. Does that answer your question? Yes, Fiona, thank you so much for your response. I think it's really helpful tips on the how and how you see that shifting in programming. Thank you. And okay. Sophie, thank, you too. thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Nancy, for the question. I, I wonder um, also, because I, Fiona raised a question around creating spaces where mums and children can come together that are safe, where they can parent outside the context of violence that they're living in their daily lives. I'd be really interested to hear from, say, Nancy yourself or Chandra or other folk in the room that are doing this work, what sort of experiences you have with that and how successful and the challenges of doing that might be. I'd be really interested to hear about that. Uh, maybe I can uh, give a response. I think in uh, the work that I do and we do with our partners, I think we've not really focused specifically on issues of mothering in domestic violence, but we've more talked about it in terms of uh, really addressing the kind of relationships that mothers have with their children. So we've oftentimes addressed it, what kind of relationship do you have with your children? in trying to really explore that and really encourage, um, you know, better relationships between uh, parents and children in terms of like a better communication between children and their parents and, you know, allowing children to have a say in the household on, you know, basic things like what they want to wear, what kind of food they want to eat. So like really encouraging that openness and uh, improved uh, communication and generally better relationships. So I think for us, and the work that I do, that's how we've tried to, you know, address the issue of uh, uh, children and their parents in the context of domestic violence. Thanks, Nancy. Is there any other, um, any, any other experiences from the group that, that we, we could learn from or just hear about? Liz, it's Chandra here. Um, just before I run off, and I'm sorry to say I have to run off uh, in a few seconds. Um, we are, so the, the parenting programs that we're delivering are all focused on enabling parents to have, um, you know, use positive discipline instead of harsh corporal punishment and improving communication uh, between children and parents. And I'd be very happy to at some stage present the, we've, the way in which we're measuring this is we've undertaken a community-wide baseline survey that covers a range of issues re relating to parenting practices, child behavior, intimate partner violence, substance use, and so on. I'd, I'd be very happy at some stage if it's possible to present our findings from the baseline. And by um, June this year, we'll have 
uh, the findings from wave two, which we conducted a year later. So I'd be happy to share those um, with you and also to talk about um, parents' experiences uh, pre and post um, going through the parenting programs. Chandra, that would be wonderful. I'm sorry that you have to run off, but we really super appreciate your inputs in, in the webinar. And yes, we will definitely take you up on that offer. So thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, before we, are, are there any other questions? I'm sure um, there might, are there other questions that people might have for Sophie and um, Fiona? We're almost reaching the end of the webinar, but I'm sure we have time for one or more one more question. Can I, can I ask one question, please? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to hear from uh, Fiona and Sophie uh, whether there are any challenges that they encountered during their study, because I know this is the very complicated start and the very sensitive. Can they share with us the challenges they face in terms of uh, uh, in the cause of collecting data? That's my interest also to hear from them. Uh, I can start if that's okay. Uh, challenges. Um, I think one of the challenges was get, getting a whole lot of women with young children together in one space at one time. <laughs> um, and we're talking about single parents here because obviously all the women had left um, domestic violence and it was really problematic to find a time and place where they could meet together. And it was really important for the research that that happened because the women ended up as each other's support. Uh, what I did was find a central location and provide childcare so that women could actually sort of come together. But that was one of the biggest challenges for me. Another challenge for me was actually walking away from the research. Well, not walking away from the research, but walking away from the women and not being able to go back and, and continue the story. But that was a personal challenge. Um, they were very courageous women and spoke very courageously about what they'd been through. Um, okay, I'll hand over to Sophie. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So many. We'd have to have another webinar <laughs> to go through all the challenges. But I think um, one of the things that we, you know, we just made the decision to use these, um, this case vignette methodology because we were worried if we started talking about violence more broadly, people would speak directly about violence they themselves were experiencing and we might not get to the intersection piece that we really needed um, to address our research question. So we decided to use these illustrated vignettes and we had three different stories and they worked really well. But of course, after when you're analyzing the data, you know, you start to think of um, all these different patterns that perhaps you didn't, you, you know, they, they necessarily limit the conversation. So there's different ways that violence might manifest that perhaps didn't come out or that we heard about through the in-depth interviews that if we were doing another round we could have um, integrated into the, the illustrated vignettes and in particular, sexual violence didn't come out that much, and we didn't elicit directly for that, um, mostly for, for ethical reasons, and we were hoping that if, if sexual violence was intersecting with other forms of violence in the home, it might emerge um, organically, and, and it didn't, and you know that I don't think we can say that's because it doesn't happen. It's probably more of a result of the way the discussions were structured. Thanks for the question. Thanks so much, Sophie and Fiona. I just wonder, as we're starting to sort of wrap up this webinar, which has been amazing, by the way, if from Fiona and Sophie, if there are any sort of last final comments or thoughts from both of you after having this really rich discussion. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I just, first of all, I mean, it's amazing to have a group of people from, from around the world. That's really exciting. And um, all of the questions and comments have been uh, really helpful to think more deeply about how we start to apply this in practice. And that was exactly, I think, where we were hoping this discussion would take us. Um, 
in terms of final thoughts, I mean, I think it's just really this, this idea of supporting experimentation because um, we don't know what, what we don't know. And we're so young in this space that I think facilitating more exchanges like this, more exchanges between um, activists and researchers and, and policymakers working on VAL specifically and VAC specifically, we can start to challenge each other constructively and um, hopefully, yeah, create more effective programs. So that would that would be um, kind of a final comment around the need for more conversations and more experimentation. And I would have to share with everything. Uh, to agree with everything that Sophie has just said. Um, it has been amazing and really thought provoking for me to think about. I mean, I love what Sophie's doing, I love the, what she's shared, but also all the participants, where they're coming from, different ways of actually working and looking at how we can swap and share ideas and maybe implement what we're doing with other people's ideas. I'd love to see this going on and we have rich discussions discussions for years to come. I think it's great. So thank you. Well, thank you both of you. Um, I really would like to sort of give a warm big thank you to both Sophie and Fiona for your time and your really wonderful, insightful and thoughtful presentations. And you've given us all a lot to think about. And I really do support the idea of experimenting and facilitating more exchanges and from our side that's something we will try and commit to. I'd also like to thank um, Mormon and Laura for managing the tech and the interactions as well as the Oak Foundation for making this webinar possible and webinars like these possible. And then I finally would like to thank all of you, the participants. Thank you so much for engaging with us, the insightful comments, for being with us for this hour and we hope to have more of these and we invite you to come and join us. And then finally, please do look up um, each of us. I think that we don't have the final slide up right now, but what we will do is um, put the webinar up online and make it available and we'll share the links with you via the SFARA update. For those of you who aren't on the SFARA update, it's a weekly update that goes out um, and you're welcome to join it. I'm just going to type the, um, the email address, you're welcome to uh, send us an email and we'll put you on the, 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 the listserv. So thank you all of us, or all of you, and um, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. And sure, yeah, and I'm sure if we all unmute, everybody would be clapping loudly. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.